Several years ago, when the Lord delivered me in 1994, I did a lot of writing. And he had me write this on the Broken Bride. If I can find it, no, it's here. Oh, shabbat I had a vision of the bride, and she was in a wheelchair. And her eyes were gouged out, and her dress was torn, and it was black. She was indolent. She had no power. She had nothing. And the Lord was behind her and he was combing her hair. And he said, you have to be gentle with her. And I said, Lord, what are you showing me? What is going on here? What does this mean? What is... And he said, will you help me? And he showed me that the bride lost her sight. She lost her strength. But God is raising her up again. That's what this whole Micah 4 is about. He's raising her up out of her wheelchair. He's put, giving her her eyes back. He's giving her strength back so she can run again. How many want that? Okay, come on now. It's time for us to come out of our being ambulant. It's time for us to come out of that. We need to be strengthened. And so this is the broken bride. I'm going to read it to you. And then I'm going to invite my sister up. Thank you, Lord. I wrote this in 2011. Thank you, Lord. How is it that you love me? Who am I that you would die for me? I am broken, a misfit, wounded beyond healing and beyond repair. Treaded upon my enemy and fallen into the deepest despair. I have become amulet, unable to stand and walk on my own. Yet you pursue me and shower me with this deep love that you have shown. Can't you see that my eyes have been gouged and my dress is torn and the white has become black? I'm such a disgrace. Yet from the darkest place, I still have the longing to see your face. How is 
is it that you love me? Who am I that you would die for me? I am not worthy of your gift of eternity. I have become invisible, can't you see? Ain't nobody falling from grace and unworthy to have a place, yet your mercy has attacked my heart with its warm embrace. What do I do? I can't run anymore, for upon your body my sins you did more, and you have stated with assurity that I shall be restored. For this love, this love is such a vehement flame, for it surely to cleanse me and restore me again. Blind to the world, yet seeing all things, man, what a joy loving him brings. Sitting, yet standing in his righteousness forever, my soul sings, watches as he cleanses my wedding. Watching as he cleanses my wedding dress from the enemy's blow, making me as pure and as white as snow. How is it that you love me, and who am I that you would die for me? For your presence has held me captive and swept me into this dance. Suddenly, right before me, before I could run, you're found holding my hand in your stance. Gazing at one another, we begin to twirl and twirl in a whirlwind of divine romance. For this music of heaven consumed us as you bowed to one knee and asked me to become your bride eternally. I am in an instant, I have become a queen, betrothed of her king. It is almost as if I have grown wings. I was flying high in this powerful love, realizing that I had finally was home and that I had come from above. I never want to feel invisible ever again. I want to be alive and free from all sin. How can it be that I was paralyzed and ready to die, yet you found me and made me your bride? Thank you. A lot of you know Marlene, and I just honor her so much. I love her dearly. I just have to say that she has a clear George Whitfield mantle on her life, so I'm going to get ready to see the cloud of glory coming up. Yeah. I'm just saying. But that was confirmed for years and years and years, and so I just needed to release that in the atmosphere. So I just thank you, Lord, for who you are. Marlene, I love you. I honor you. It's my sissy.
people see you, receive from you, Father God. And God, I just give you glory in advance for what you're about to do, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm a wretched, wretched man. But Jesus Christ, when he came, you see, I got to tell a little bit of my testimony before I get started. Because, see, I was in the middle of a meth lab when Jesus Christ hey, found me. Woo! I was in the middle of a meth lab when the spirit of the living God came on the inside. And he said, I choose you. And I want you. And I love you. And, and everything about me, I was like, God, how could you choose me? Have you seen the, the marks on my body? Have you seen the marks on my body? Have you seen where I put the needle in my arm five minutes before you got here, Lord? Have you seen the metal that's in the building, God? Oh, my God, have you seen what it's done to my life? I'm a complete wreck. My mind is not sound. And you know what I mean? Yes. The Lord spoke to me and he said, that's the condition of my bride today. You can call it drugs if you want to. You can call it drugs if you want to. He said, but that's the condition of my bride. They know, they know that I love them and they want them, but they come up with every excuse in the book of why they can't come to me. They come up with every excuse in the book of why they can't help someone. Why they can't do something for me on my behalf. And this is what this story is about. You see, I was the man among the tombs. I was living among the dead. I was dead until the Spirit of God came in and he brought me back to life. He brought me back to life. He breathed the breath of life in me and he said, I love you and I have need of you. Well, won't you come? Won't you come? But I had to be real. I had to say I love the needle and the drugs more than I love you, Lord. We got to be real with God tonight. There's a transforming power in this room that wants to transform you from glory to glory. But if you hide that shame, if you hide that, if you hide those things from God, then, then you're not going anywhere. You're going to remain stuck. And the sadness about that is, is that you're a leader. You're a leader. You're leading people stuck. Hey. Oh. As your friend, I ain't here, here to be your friend tonight. I ain't here to be your friend. I'm here to deliver the word of God. Come on now. So I want to read out of Mark chapter 5 because we're going forward and then backwards. Because God wants to talk to you about the past. He wants to talk to you about some things you've been going through. He wants to talk to you about where you're at right now, the stuck condition that you're in. And I'm talking to me first. I had to get this first. Don't think I'm exempt because I'm not. I ain't exempt. The word of God comes through me first, then I gotta deliver it so I get it twice. So I'm just like double stuck. Double stuff. Hallelujah. Not like an Oreo, not double stuff. Double stuck. Yeah, double stuff. I'm double stuck. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So in Mark chapter 5. And, and I wanted to do something different, and the Lord changed me right at the last minute. And I got here like 10 minutes to five. He said, no, I want this. This is what I want. And i got to obey him. See, i got to obey him because when he came into meth lab, I was begging for death. He gave me life. He changed the death that I was for his life. And I was a mess. I didn't have a sound mind. I didn't know who I was. He gave me a sound mind. I know who I am today. He changed me. He transformed me. Just like that. Hallelujah. I was set free as soon as I admitted that I loved him more than God. He said, I said, if you'll take it from me. And he took it just like that. Jesus. Transform me. Transform me. And just like that. But I had to come into agreement with what God said. He loved me and he had me. You know how hard it is to come into agreement with I love you when I didn't even know what love was? Jesus. I didn't know what it was. You know how hard it is to come into agreement? I have need of you and you're black and blue from head to toe because of the trap marks of the needles that went in and out of your arm. That every part of your body is full of trap marks. And all you care about is your next fix. But now the presence of God is here. And he's talking to you. And he begins to speak to you. And you got to know, is, is this a fable? Is this an illusion? But the power came with the presence. The power came with the presence. And I felt the addiction. 
Christian Jesus. And I was restored and set free. So there's this man, and he's in the tombs. It said, and they came unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarene. I probably didn't say it wrong. That's another thing. Why'd you pick me, God? I don't even read right. <laughs> but the power and the presence are there. Yes. The power and the presence are there. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately, that's where God wants me to stop. Jesus. And he wants me to go back to chapter 4. See, you might be in a storm right now. You might be going through something. And all of a sudden, here comes a demon-possessed man right up in the middle of your storm. You just got out of the boat. The boat was the waves and the winds. And everything was coming in the boat. You, you just got a word from God that says... We're going to the other side. You just got a word. He said, we're going to the other side. Let's go back to chapter 4. Let me, let me get, I need to slow down. The Holy Spirit's telling me to slow down. And, and number 435. And the same day, when even was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Those words are read. Those words are the words of God. Jesus Christ. He said that they were going to the other side. He had already spoken a word because he knew a storm was coming. So he had already told them what they were going to do. But what happens next? And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship, and they were also with him. Okay, and he liked. <laughs> other, they were also with him, other little ships. And there arose a great storm. There arose a great storm. Okay, they had a word from God that they were going to the other side. But now, guess what? God gave you a word that you're the bride. He gave you a word that you're the bride of Christ. But somewhere you done forgot because a storm done came up. A storm done brewed over what he said about you. And you forgot what he said because he said some things over you. And he put some things in you. And we done forgot what he said. Wow. When he came to me, he said, I love you and I have need of you. The definition of that is great. I never knew the need in my community until I was called to my community. Okay, the need is great. It's great. This team of disciples, what are disciples? Followers of Christ. These followers of Christ are now in a storm and they don't know what to do. And he's asleep in the boat, right? But they've already had a word. Did God give you a word and you think he's asleep because you're going through a storm and you forgot about the word of God that he gave you? About it. He already told you. Come on. But guess what? I'm in a storm and it doesn't feel like the word that he gave me is good enough hey. to keep me. Oh, Jesus. My God, the word kept them. Jesus. And they became scared because he rebuked the wind and the wave. Yes. And then they said, Who is this man that he can rebuke the wind and the wave and it obeys him? Just paraphrasing. Now we need to go back to the immediately. Okay, I just came out of a storm. I'm, I, I, I'm uh, shooken up pretty bad. I'm pretty bad shaken up over that last storm. And I'm about to step out on the shore. I'm about to get out of this storm and here comes a naked, crazy, wild man that needs something that's on the inside of me. Jesus. But God, you, you don't remember what I did yesterday? I forgot the word you gave me. You don't remember what I did. I forgot, God. I forgot that you gave me a word to get me to the other side. I forgot that I'm the bride. I forgot that I'm yours. I forgot that I have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of me. I forgot what I could rebuke. 
rebuke the wind and the wave. And I can make it through myself. And now here comes this crazy man headed right for me. And you want me to deliver him after the storm I just went through? Woo! My God. My God. Talk about justice. I asked God about justice and I had my idea of what I thought it was. And he said there's justice for that man on me too. Hey, the man at the community did everything they could do. They did everything they could do. They said they found him. And they put shackles on him. And there was nothing they could do. But God spoke to me and he said he's well known in the city. Why is he well known in the city? Because they couldn't handle him. There was nothing they could do to him. He was well known because they tried everything they could do to help him. And there was no help for him. So they put him on the outside of the city amongst the tombs. And now here comes the 13 men, the 12 disciples in Jesus. And they're about to put their foot on the, 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 the scene. But they just went through a terrible storm. And they don't feel like delivering nobody. They don't feel like setting nobody free. This man's life is dead. But I just went, do you know what I just went through, Lord? Do you know the storm I'm in, God? Do I have to, God? I'm tired. I didn't get any sleep last night. The waves and the winds got great, God. They're great. I was scared for my life. I almost lost my own life. Now you want me to give life to somebody else? My God. He said there's justice for that man. There's justice for that man. He said you get up. You get up. And he said when Jesus put his foot out of the boat and he put it on the land, that the man ran from afar off. He ran Naked. I don't know about y'all, but if I seen a naked person running towards me, I'm going to be like, what is going on? <laughs> Not only naked, but it said he wasn't in his right mind. So he's saying things. Not in his right mind. And, and the Lord spoke to me about some things about the disciples. They were glad that the, that, that storm that they were in was over. They weren't about to go in another storm. Jesus. Because this is a storm. What if they don't make it out of this? What if this wild, crazy man kills them? They just made it out of the last storm. What if this one takes them out? So they didn't have much courage that day. So God said to speak courage over his bride today. Yeah. That you're courageous and strong. Yes. That you don't forget the word of the Lord that's on the inside of you. Because someone's about to step out of the storm and there's a demoniac waiting on you. You're the one God chose to set him free or her free. It's you. And God don't care what storm you just came out of. I'm in the middle of one right now. Kidney stones and they hurt. Like heck. But God said go. He said go. And I'm here. And then he said that the the, the men, I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget. You know, they weren't <coughs> fond of being around things that were unclean. Okay? Because it was against their custom in that day. God said, I gotta tear down some customs in you. I gotta tear down some things in you so that my justice can hit the earth. And that the one that you think ain't worthy of getting set free, because they're worse than you ever been. They did more than you ever did. They've been to prison ten times. They walk out cussing. Ooh, don't do that around me. I'm too holy for that. <laughs> Get over yourself. Amen. Let me tell you something. The ones that God sends me, they don't smell good. They don't talk right. They don't have a sound mind. They're, and I hug them. I'm all up on them because I know what lives on the inside of me. I know that whatever's on the inside of me can set you free. And I'm up in your business. I'm all about up in your business. And so he was talking to me that, that the 
disciples didn't go around unclean things. They didn't go around things that were among the dead. They sure didn't go around things that uh, lived by the pig farm because pigs were unclean in that day. And God said, you need to scratch what you think you're going to go around because I'm fixing to change everything and you're fixing to get dirty. So if you got this pretty picture about what you think you're going to do, you need to scratch it. You need to start over. Because God said he's taking you places that he ain't never took anybody. He brought you here to this leaders conference because there's some people out there that they, they, they won't do what God's called them all to do. They won't go where God's called them to go. See, these people didn't want to get out of the boat and go into this storm. But God said, I'm fixing to move some people. And they won't go where I want them to go. They won't do what I want them to do because they don't think it's me. And he said, scratch your idea of what you think is me. Because he's about to take you in the tombs among some dirty things. Because this end time revival, this end time that's upon us, there's so many people that they've been to the church, they've been in the building, and, and they've been rejected. They've been sent out. They, they don't smell good, and they don't look good, and they don't talk right, and they ain't got it all together. But God said, that's the one that I pick. But I need somebody that will go and tell them who I am for real, for real, the truth. Then I die for them. And not worry about what you went through. But see, we get caught up in the storm. We get caught up in what I've been through. Well, you don't know what I've been through. A lot of people don't know what I've been through because it's only for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Only testify yes. when God tells you to testify. If I gave you a resume, I preached a sermon one time called My Resume. And the people in the room were on the floor because they couldn't believe that I made it out of all that. Wow. But it wasn't me. See, there was another man in the fire with him. Yeah. It wasn't me. I didn't get out of there of my own accord. I got out of there because Jesus Christ was in me. And that's what he wants me to remind you. Is that he is in you. You can handle anything that he tells you to do. You are fully equipped to do exactly what God calls you to do. Fully equipped. He's sending us after the ones that no one else wants. But man, when he puts his spirit down on the inside of them, they're sold out for the rest of their life. There is no going back. There is no going back. They don't care what comes their way. There is no going back because there's nothing to go back to. Once you have that love of God, once the love of God invades you and comes in and delivers you, there ain't no going back. You want somebody that's dedicated? Go get them. Go get them. You know what the Lord showed me, and, and I didn't really fully understand it, and maybe someone in here will, but I'm going to release it because he's asking me to. You know that scripture where it says that you go, and go somewhere and they don't receive you, and Dust off your feet and move on. He said, even when you dust off your feet, my presence stays there. He said, my presence is in the dust. He said, you think you lost them. You think you lost them. He said, but my presence is in the dust. So just because someone rejected you, they rejected him. Just dust your feet off and leave his presence there. Thank you, Lord. Jesus went ahead and took the disciples there where law said they couldn't go. Law said they couldn't be around the pigs and the pig farms. Law said they couldn't be around the dead. Law said they couldn't be around the unclean thing. The Lord was showing me that. He's about to take some rituals that you've been taught because you've been taught more law than love. You've been taught more law than you have the love of God. The love of God covers a multitude of sin. The love of God compels them to come in. The love of God is what got me when he came in and he said, I want you. And I was 
in the middle of sin. They said he'd never go where sin was. I was sin. And he came for me. I've been in addiction for many years and no one ever came. No one ever came. No one would listen to God when he said, go get her. No one would listen to God when he said, go out there and tell her about me. They wouldn't listen because they wouldn't go to meth lab. And my testimony in the church is not popular. But the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit that's in me is. Because he did something in me. And he transformed me right in front of the whole city. That's why I said, this book is about me. Because I was the drug dealer. I was the one that was packaging up meth. I was the one with the needle in my arm. I was the one that my mind wasn't right. I was crazy. I was, I was hallucinating. I was seeing things that wasn't real. But when Jesus came on the scene and he sent a pastor from a church and he was walking by and I cussed him out, I said, get off my property. And he started to leave and the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. And he said, I got to go back and release a word over her. And he came back and he said, Jesus loves you. He has need of you. And he left. He didn't add to and he didn't take away from her. But he left and I just walked in the house like nothing. I got in the house in the presence of God and faith and my privacy. What God's asking you to do is release the word. He's asking you to release the word. He ain't asking you to do the work. He's saying release my justice over my people. The justice of God for this man was that when he came, no demon in hell could keep him from getting at the feet of Jesus. And when he got to the feet of Jesus, he was set free. Yes. But the Lord showed me. He said, Monday I got Jesus, but Tuesday I'm too busy. Too busy. Because see, Sunday I was at church, so Monday I'm all about Jesus. But Tuesday done rolled around and I got bills to pay. And he showed me that the bride picks to choose the dates that she's Jesus. And he said, I live on the inside of you. And I've embodied my presence on the inside of you. And you walk right past the man that's asking you for change because you ain't got no Jesus on that day. And he, he, he was telling me, take the time. Take the time. Because he's father time. And someone took the time to go get you. Hey, Jesus. Wow. Someone took the time. I don't know everybody's testimony in here. But someone took the time to prophesy a word of God over Alicia seven years ago. And she's set free. And she will not look back. She's headed forward. She's an intercessor for the kingdom of heaven. And she's still standing seven years later. There's a man in the ministry that they said he got 80 years stacked against him. 80 years stacked against him. And God said, go tell him I'm going to dead dock it. That's all he wanted me to say. He said, go tell him I'm going to dead dock it. I didn't even know what that meant. What does that mean? Let me research that. No. Go tell him. I'm going to dead dock it the 80 years that are stacked against him because I'm calling him into the ministry and I'm going to use him for my glory. And them 80 years ain't got nothing on the word of God. Jesus. Guess what? Dead dock it. <laughs> How do you dead dock it 80 years? I can't do it. Only God. Only God. So when God sends you, and he asks you to release a word. It's because he's going to do a work. Yes. It's because he wants justice in that area. Come See, on. the justice for him was 80 years. But the justice that God had for his life was Woo! dead knock at that thing. Yes. There's been a transformation in that heart. Dead knock at that thing. Get rid of it. Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Whatever you're up against, whatever you're facing, whatever you think you can't do, it ain't you doing it anyway. 
Yes. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, well, I can't talk to people like that. It ain't you. Yes. Yes. It ain't you that does it. Uh, You're a mouthpiece for the Spirit of the Lord. Yes. Go do what he said do. Because if you don't, you're in direct disobedience unto the Lord. Yes. And you know what? You, ne you never know whose deliverance you're holding. Hey, you don't know. There might be a woman in this room that God said, I want you to go tell that woman that I said this, and her deliverance is in your lips. Yes. The word of God that comes out of your mouth. But you're too scared. God said, I'll give you courage. If you just take that first step and get out of the boat. The demoniac will be set free. So, <clears throat> yes, sir. The Lord said there's some people that's been through some storms and they're pretty shook up. They're pretty shook up. The last storm about took you out. <sighs> It was a storm that shook you to the core. You didn't know if you was going to make it out alive. But guess what the next instruction is? Step out onto the next assignment. Whoa. Whoa. Don't take time. Do it now. Do it now. I hear him saying, do it now. They were traumatized. The disciples. They probably thought, man, we disobeyed God because he said we were going to make it to the other side, but we didn't listen. In trauma. Let down because they didn't believe God. But the next assignment is right in front of them. Who cares about what happened yesterday? Get up and go do what God called you to do. Yesterday is gone. Gone. And the same Jesus that said, get in the boat, we are going to the other side, is the same Jesus that put the next assignment right in front of you. And when you help the next assignment, you will be healed. You will be healed. All the trauma is going to go. Because guess what? The next assignment's in worse condition than you are. He's a demon, demoniac, naked, living in the tombs. He's hanging with the dead. Everyone in your boat's still alive. He ranks. You know, if you're living in amongst a tomb, you ain't got no place to take no bath. What do you think he smells like? That's probably why he ain't got no clothes on. Because they stunk and he got rid of them. So they get out of the boat and the person that's running towards them is in worse condition than the storm they just came out of. How could you imagine when you see all those demons come out of him? How he must have felt. My God, when someone gets set free, I rejoice. I rejoice. Rejoice. So that tells me that the next assignment has joy in it. You're traumatizing. God's trying to give you some joy, but you won't do the next assignment to get the joy. God's about to give you some assignments when you walk out of this room. One word from God can change your life. One word. Just don't add to or take away from. Just speak for him. Release a word for him. It's not you. See, we get so wrapped up in, I can't do that. It ain't you. rituals and things that we do because we've been taught that it's this way of walking it 
and he wants to change some things. The generation that we're dealing with now ain't like the generation that we lived in. Nothing. They're changing everything. If we won't mold ourselves to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, they're going to die the way they are. Because we're too caught up in a ritual. I love the young people. Even my granddaughter, she's 15. I can't minister to her the way I think it should be. I have to ask God to give me a nugget for her. That as I minister to her unto the Lord, and it never is what I think it's going to be. Because this generation, they're trying to twist their mind and, and into things that is not God. And if we are not going to be pliable for the Spirit of God to work through us, then we're no good. We have to be ready. We have to. We have to get rid of the way we think things are going to go. Just like I was studying and showing myself approved and had my message all ready and it's about to get in the shower and the Lord said, go back. I, I've changed it on you. I have a choice to make right there. Yes, sir, I'll go back. I'm supposed to be there at 4 o'clock. You know that, right? Right, Lord? You know that, right? He said, go back. And he showed me this. And he said, The storm that you're in don't matter. It don't matter that you heard the word of the Lord and you didn't obey. It don't matter that you thought you were going to die in the last storm. Get up and go do the assignment that is in front of you. I don't want no blood on my hands. I don't want to misrepresent God. I don't want to be in disobedience because I don't feel like it or I'm in pain. Or God, do you know I just passed a kidney stone? You know what my body's going through right now? My body's traumatized, but so are these men in the boat. When he says go, he will equip you. to go to the next assignment. I'm on my next assignment. And this man got justice that day. Because see, the community threw him out. They got rid of him. They said we can't do nothing with him. They all knew who he was. They tell him, don't go down that road. That's where he's at. Don't go near him. He's among the tombs. Don't go that way. They done convinced them, hey, if you don't go that way, then we ain't got to deal with him. But Jesus knew. He knew the brokenness of that man. He knew that that man was traumatized with demons. He knew that it was a legion of demons. He wasn't dealing with just one. What if he asked you to go deal with some legions? You know, the part of this story that really got me was that the demons knew they know their end. They know their end. They knew. Is it our time? How come we don't know? The demons know. Why don't we know? The demons know who Jesus is. Why don't we know who he is? Too busy judging people. I had a man Tuesday at the homeless meeting. He said, the spirit of the living God drew me in here and I got to testify. I didn't know him from Adam. God said, let him do it. He got up there and he testified and he talked about how God drew him in the building. How the spirit of God was there and drew him in. And how he had been in an accident. He wasn't supposed to be walking. That God restored his health back to him and he was walking. And that he had to give God all glory and honor and praise. He was on his next assignment. Yes. He was carried in the building, and guess what it did? I broke down. 
Man, I broke down. I wept and wept and wept. And then here come the next guy. And he says, where's Merlene at?